Welcome to Let's Talk Climate. I'm Rebecca Rear, Director of the Climate for Health program at Eco America. And while we're all tuning in virtually, I am hosting from just outside of Washington, DC on lands shepherded by the Nakachank and Piscataway people. I'm looking forward to today's topic, advocating for children's health, tools from the 2021 Lancet Countdown with our fantastic guests. Dr. Lisa Patel, Clinical Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at Stanford School of Medicine. Hi, Lisa. Hi, everyone. And Dr. Aaron Bernstein, Interim Director of the Center for Climate Health and the Global Environment at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Hi, Ari. Hey, Rebecca. And Dr. Rebecca Phillipsborn, Assistant Professor at the School of Medicine at Emory University. Hi, Becca. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks so much for being here today. And today is an exciting day because the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change and the accompanying US brief were released. Can each of you take a minute to talk about what the Lancet Countdown is and how you use this data set each year in your work? So Lisa, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so the Lancet, it's a really exciting initiative that draws together um, academic professionals, researchers, uh, folks in public health. I think it's over 70 institutions that are involved in the writing of this report that's very collaborative. And it's really looking across some of the major health indicators um, of what climate change means for health, and then really coming up with concrete policy proposals, what can policymakers do uh, to enact policies to, to protect our climate and our health in the future. Um, in terms of some of the, the research and how I use it in my practice, and there's some, just some really great um, pearls that I use, particularly in my advocacy and my counseling with patients, you know, things, for example, that, that for example, that um, the wildfires in California cost us $32 billion. Um, I use statistics like that when I talk to my legislative decision makers on how this is really a forward investment we need to make because of how expensive it is when we don't make forward investments in terms of the, the health of our residents in California, or talking about the fact that even though I live in California and we have so much wildfire smoke here, 25% of wildfire smoke exposure blows across the continental United States as well. So this isn't just a West problem, this is a whole US problem. Those are just a few examples of how I use that data. Becca, you want to go next? Sure, happy to. I can just build on what Lisa said by saying it's an amazing collaborative effort and we have to give a shout out to um, the authorship team and the core team. I know some probably heard Renee Salas and Jeremy has talked earlier today, but the whole core team has done just an amazing job yet again, bringing us all together. And as working group members for this effort on the pediatric side, some of what we get to do is help distill the indicators on climate and health and be part of that decision for what do we want to emphasize this year for the U.S brief and how can we as pediatricians make sure that we're representing children's health and we're bringing up children where it's appropriate to do so. This effort really helps equip us as clinicians with science and health to bring to policy discussions and make sure we're centering health and centering health equity. Well, I don't like being in a position of having to go after these to uh, folks. So um, I will say first and foremost, I will absolutely echo what uh, Lisa and Becca have said. Um, and, and I think that for me here in Boston, I think Bostonians often get the impression that because we don't have wildfires on our door and hurricanes are pretty rare. Uh, and boy, if it's February, it should be really, be really nice for a little hotter out. Uh, climate change can seem somewhat far afield, but you know, for me, the Lancet Countdown is sort of a, a really good grounding to remember where we're at when it comes to climate and health. I think it's easy to lose sight that change is happening and we're seeing it more and more. Uh, and obviously, even here in Boston, in the past uh, around Boston, we've had torrential uh, rainfalls. Um, so to me, it, it really is a sort of milestone every year to to really bear in mind that while this is a long haul challenge, um, we need to focus uh, our attention uh, on, a, on, a, on a regular basis. Yeah, and you've, you've actually already started to talk a little bit about sort of mentioning Boston, talking about wildfire, you know, like there's regional 
differences in how we're seeing climate change and therefore the effect it's having on people and our health. And one thing that the Lancet Countdown US Brief and also the US Global Change Research Program has been doing is talking about those regional differences in climate impacts to better help us prepare and address the needs of folks living in different parts of the country. Um, and we do actually have three different regions represented on this call, uh, I guess, four, if you count me, I guess DC is different enough from Boston. Uh, so can you talk about what climate change looks like where you are um, and how you're each experiencing climate change personally, maybe you're sort of in, in seeing your patients. So Becca, um, do you want to start off? Sure, happy to. And while Bostonians may expect it to be really cold in February down here in Georgia, it's usually when it starts getting warmer, except Lately, we're actually seeing daffodils start to bloom in December before Christmas. That's really weird, right? And that's the environmental side. But that brings me to what I'm most concerned about here in the South now is extreme heat exposure. We already have too many hot, sticky, oppressive, those unbearable, humid days in the Southeast. And we're expected to have more of those, not just hot days, but heat waves. That is dangerous. And heat itself can, of course, cause health harm, but it also means more days that it's just not safe to do the things that are necessary to support health. And for kids, that can mean playing outside. It can mean participating in sports. And for their parents, that can mean less days of where it's safe to work outside if they have an outdoor job. So heat is one of the ways here in the South, and there are others too, um, but that's one of the, the things that I'm quite worried about. I thought that the brief this year did a really good job of talking about the particular risk of infants for heat nationally and saying that infants under one year experience a total of nearly 22 million more days of heat wave exposure in 2020 with respect to the 1986 to 2005 baseline. And that really emphasizes this is here and now, this is something that is already affecting our patients. Okay, you want to go next? So uh, one of the things that has happened more in uh, New England than uh, any other region of the country is the strengthening of the water cycle. So we get rainfall events that are much heavier than they used to be. And, and Boston is a city that was built a long time ago. So our infrastructure is uh, really getting stressed, the water infrastructure in particular, and, and that matters for all kinds of things that relate to health, uh, particularly the health of children. So um, we see growing numbers of, of swimmable ponds closed. So kids who wanted to go out and swim this summer were at risk, um, but fortunately the public health department in cities in the Commonwealth were pretty on top of it, but nonetheless, we're, we're seeing that. Um, we're, we're seeing flood events. Um, there is a three and a half inches of rain, which doesn't, really stand up to the hurricane rains we see on the Gulf Coast, but in a place like Worcester that, that submerged a large parts of the town. Um, providers there couldn't see uh, their patients because they couldn't get to clinic. Uh, and, and also our infrastructure in terms of electricity transmission is also at risk, um, including from heat. Um, when you have too much heat, too much demand, um, utilities have to shut down power and also from you know, heavy uh, storms, winds, and, and so um, power outages have been a challenge in some parts of, of the Commonwealth. Um, and you know the, the report makes clear, and, and one point I think um, was really appropriately emphasized uh, is, is how all of these effects really magnify health disparities um, and, and, and create new ones. And, and especially in the past year when the health disparities that existed were really, um, exploited uh, by the pandemic, uh, the fissures that they created were, were really torn open. Uh, we had ongoing climate change uh, effects. And so we really come to recognize how these, these, these shocks, whether they're from climate or pandemics, um, really speak to the critical importance of addressing health disparities. And so that's one thing I, that, that folks here in Massachusetts and Boston are really um, I think keenly aware of is, is that, you know, infrastructure is an equity issue. Climate is a major force. And critically, we know that climate actions uh, can get at those health disparities, whether that's through active transportation, better diets, improving air quality. These all are major forces in trying to address the major health burdens of children, uh, and particularly 
health equity concerns. Lisa? Yeah, so similar to Becca, you know, when we're, we're kind of seeing three things, I would say, in the in the West and the Southwest is we're seeing extreme heat, we're seeing wildfires, and we're seeing a mega drought, a severe drought. Um, so in terms of extreme heat, I think one of the challenges in the West, I, I grew up in Texas and Houston, where we would go, you know, from our air-conditioned home to our air-conditioned car to our air-conditioned school buildings. And in the West, we're just not adapted um, for these episodes of extreme heat. And we saw that really play out in the Pacific Northwest when they had the heat dome there, where the temperatures topped 116 degrees in Portland. And during that week, they saw a spike in ED visits by 70%, which, which they report on the Lancet as well. And so it really brings home this issue of, of, of both, as Ari mentioned, infrastructure, you know, in places that are not adapted for these extreme temperatures. Um, we see it play out, and we particularly see it play out with our communities or individuals that might be experiencing um, housing insecurity. That's tried to be answered by things like cooling centers, but what we're learning is that um, these cooling centers are often not utilized by community members because they're just not places that they're used to going to anyway. So really thinking about how we're going to adapt in a region that will see more extreme heat events that very adversely impact health. We are seeing more intense and frequent wildfires that has been you know, 2018 broke records until 2019 broke records until 2020 broke records. And this year we're on pace to either meet or exceed the acres burned from our prior years. And when those wildfires happen, we're, we're thinking about three things, right? First, we're thinking about the physical destruction. Um, people obviously die in these wildfires every year that haven't been able to evacuate. Um, we think about the wildfire smoke. Um, we know that that pollution has adverse health effects. Certain populations are more vulnerable, um, children, pregnant women, and the elderly in particular. And then we have to think about the mental health impacts. Um, I worked with a school psychologist in Sonoma where these kids have been evacuated so many times that she says that when kids so much as see smoke in the sky, they start crying and having panic attacks. Um, and so thinking about the mental health impacts of either being displaced, you losing your home, and knowing that, that these children are going to be experiencing this over and over again. And then, as I mentioned, you know, RE has, they have an abundance of water on the East Coast. We are in the opposite situation here in the West and the Southwest. We are seeing an unprecedented drought in recorded history for 126 years. We have not had a, a situation quite this dire. Um, and what that means for, for water access and availability, particularly in rural communities and indigenous communities, it's, it's a huge problem. So one of the things that the Lancet Countdown also said was that there's not, uh, it, it looks pretty dire. And sort of what, what I'm getting from this conversation is uh, things are pretty dire. Um, and so I also, I do want to, so I'm glad you mentioned impacts to mental health because, you know, that, that, that can be, it can be daunting, right? Uh, to, to work on this. It can be, where do you start? What do you do? And we're going to get to solutions and we have, you know, lots of tools and resources that people can act. Um, but, you know, the IPCC report says, you know, code red for humanity. The Lancet Countdown says code red for health. Uh, you know, it's an emergency. We got to do something. Uh, so what do you do sort of like, do you grapple with that feeling? Do you see it in your patients? And how do you, you know, how, how do you work on that uh, in terms of your own sort of mental health and caring for yourself to care for the planet, um, but also for your patients? Um, and what do you do when it feels overwhelming? On, on days like today, actually, I get super pumped because everyone's paying attention to the issue that I care about today. Like every newspaper has, you know, climate change and health uh, in, in the front page. And I'm seeing it on Twitter and social media and people are, are, are engaging in tools and resources for solutions and talking, nerding out about the science. You know, it's a great balance. Um, so I get, I get, I, is that bad? I get excited on days like today when all the, the bad news comes out. But um, how do you, how do you sort of, because uh, people means people pay, are paying attention today. Um, but how how do you um, how are you talking about uh, you know thinking about mental health impacts for yourself and for your patients? And Lisa, since you mentioned it, do you want to get from there? Yeah, I mean, I, I really rely upon uh, the community that I work with. So everybody on this call, for example, y'all are my my source of inspiration to keep going. Um, and I think my other source of inspiration, I do most of my work with um, medical students and undergraduates. Um, because I, they give me a lot of hope um, that I, that uh, I'm right. There's no other choice here. We're talking about saving, um, saving our planet. I mean, what, what else can we do? Yes, this, this information is distressing, and the number of problems in California seem ever mounting. 
but I've also seen communities mobilize. I've seen organizations mobilize. I hear um, our elected officials behind these issues. And so I, I have a lot of hope. Um, I understand that we have big problems ahead of us, but I also see big opportunities for us to come together. Becca? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think um, it's important to have days like today where we are calling attention to the code red status and the emergency here. We're like the little child in clinic who's found the code blue button and everyone comes running, right? That's us, that's today. And I think that is important that there are still many people who do not recognize the urgency of this challenge. And we need to continue to communicate that. Um, as far as taking care of our, our own mental health needs in this crisis, there is some uh, solace through engagement, the ability to do what we do on a daily basis. And Ari mentioned already some of those tools that we have when talking about even just diet with our families in the day-to-day -day course of our practice that makes this not separate from our jobs, but part of our everyday job. And I think that can help bridge the dissonance that we can feel when we think of these as totally disconnected. Um, as, as Lisa mentioned, this group is my inspiration, our growing group of climate advocates. And of course, my uh, absolutely incredible student catalyst in this space who I have to give a big shout out to. There's a lot of reason for hope, but we also have to get going. And it's important to have days like today where we feel that code red. Sorry. I would, I really want to underscore what Lisa and Becca said about the sense of community. I, I've been on climate and health long enough to remember when I routinely was met when I was at a meeting or, you know, even with colleagues in the hospital and said, oh, I'm a pediatrician. I work on climate change. And I was just like, I might as well have been from Mars. And so having a group of folks who one can talk to about these issues and who are friends is, is uh, worth more than anything. I, you know, we also, I mean, just to underscore the youth component, to me, the most important thing that's happened in the last five years on climate is the youth climate movement. Um, you know, to me, the question isn't when we're gonna really come to grips with what we're dealing with and, and take action. It, it, it isn't whether we're going to do that, it's when we're gonna do that. And, and I think the, the urgency coming from younger people um, is really influencing how people think about it. Uh, the last point uh, I'll make is that I know a lot of providers are a part of this, this session and, and we'll watch it later. You know, uh, you know, number one question is what can I do as a provider uh, when it comes to climate? And we know that our healthcare sector, uh, including outpatient care, is a major contributor to greenhouse gases. You know, somewhere around 8% of our total greenhouse gas emissions comes from healthcare, and that's from children uh, getting hospitalized, needing uh, clinic visits. So there are all kinds of things, and we'll probably talk more about that, but the single most important thing we can do is to keep children healthy. You know, the, the best way to decarbonize our practice is to ensure that um, children are well. And so what we do every day is actually a major part of the solution. And the better we can do it, the better we can keep children healthy, let them reach their full potential. Um, we'll go a long way to, to addressing the, the problem within our own uh, sphere of influence. Yeah, I mean, I don't blame uh, youth of today for being angry uh, when they find out that turns out we knew about climate change uh, many decades ago and didn't do anything bold. Um, and so now we need to do extra bold uh, today <laughs> to, to get to where we need to be. Um, and so and so I don't, you know, it's anger feels like the right response. Uh, and so, but to channel that into the positive uh, movements that we're seeing that do center, you know, justice and equity and inclusion, youth are doing that a heck of a lot better than sort of the climate movement brought more broadly for the last little while. Um, and so I think, you know, just seeing that is, is great. And we, you know, what we're seeing more and more is, you know, we're being asked to follow and support their leadership uh, you know, it's it's a shift in framework from what can we do for our kids, and it's more what how can we lift up what they what they're already doing and the ideas that they have. 
Um, and so it's, and seeing that shift, and I know um, Jess uh, put into the chat here, uh, shout out to Mark and Jess who run the Let's Talk Climate behind the scenes. Uh, and they're uh, typing in a blog post that we just posted for Children's Health Month um, that includes uh, some, some recent statements from pediatric societies globally talking about the importance of, of following youth leadership. Um, and I believe there's a, uh, right now, uh, there's folks getting on their bikes to go to the UN Climate Conference, COP26, uh, and logging bike bike miles to bring attention to this, and especially children's health and how climate, bold climate action uh, can really uh, protect, is is a critical solution for children's health. Um, and so shout out to, to everybody taking those, those actions. Um, and so Ari, you mentioned clinical practice. And so I do want to um, lift up a question we got from the audience. Um, uh, Lisa in Texas asks, how can healthcare providers best be mobilized to address climate change in their everyday clinical practice? What are some examples of effective or successful clinical practice efforts for the clinical practice setting? And Ari, since you started, why don't we, uh, why don't you pick it up? Uh... Yeah, well, it's, you know, I think to you know, reiterate to some extent what I said before. We can we can try and do our best and in, in preventing uh, harm and 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 more importantly, uh, doing what we can to make sure children reach their full potential. And and it's not surprising in many ways that pediatricians really among the first medical providers to be concerned with climate change because we are primarily concerned with keeping people healthy, preventing harm. And our focus in some ways is different than a lot of other medical providers who are, are more or less stuck with dealing with problems after they, they've, they've started. You know, there are, there are many other um, concrete ways, and you're going to probably learn more from Lisa and Becca because they do real pediatrics, um, and I, I work in a hospital. Um, but, you know, there's really any of the issues that we deal with in pediatrics around social determinants have climate angles. And whether it's on the resilience front, like we ask children all kinds of questions about asthma risks and, you know, cigarette smoke, um, we don't necessarily educate about the air quality index um, and how that can really be important to keeping children with asthma out of harm's way. Uh, and so doing that kind of work to really promote resilience to, to air quality in that case. Um, to mitigation, you know, um, dietary guidance, we're always talking about diets, at every well child checkup. And, you know, it turns out as a happy coincidence, a lot of diets that are better for children are also much less polluting. And, you know, I think one of the key messages that's critical in these conversations that try and bridge clinical practice and climate is to remember we need to start where the families and children that we're caring for are at. Um, I think that there are many families who are very concerned about climate change where talking about that is perfectly great up front. There are many families, and especially now, uh, where getting food on the table is a real challenge. And so the questions around food security become paramount, but it turns out that eating a climate-friendly diet is actually, or can be, uh, very inexpensive. Uh, and so, you know, finding those bridges uh, that, that we can build is a, is a really important part of trying to connect these things in our practice. Yeah, Lisa? Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm actually also a hospital-based pediatrician, and, and part of my counseling has become now, because we have these terrible wildfire seasons, because um, we now, all of us, have the apps on our phone to check AQI, I actually build into every one of my children that is hospitalized for wheezing-associated respiratory infections or for asthma, I always build in some counseling about AQI, air filters, staying safe at home. Um, out here, we have our Western Environmental Specialty Pediatric. Peshu, Western Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit, um, where they have wonderful resources. And I'll just cut and paste a lot of the flyers that they have meant for families um, right into the after visit summary for my families to just give them those resources um, that they can walk out the door with. Um, and then I just wanted to highlight the work of Andrew Lewandowski, um, who he counsels every one of his patients um, in an outpatient um, setting uh, on climate change, sort of talking about integrating some of that counseling together when we're thinking about things like dietary choices or active transportation. Um, and so not asking additional questions, just bringing a climate lens. And I know Becca and Ari actually just put out a paper on this exact topic. Um, so there are ways to do this that isn't extra time, but I'll, I'll turn that one over to Becca because she both wrote the paper on it and has more experience on it. 
Thanks, Lisa. And you guys have covered some of those ways to do what we call a climate-informed primary care visit. And, and I can touch on probably a couple more. I want to zoom out really big for a moment as Ari was talking about prevention and think about what we as a profession can do really to bridge this evidence base between public health and clinical practice. And as like a concrete example now and why efforts like today's Lancet launch are exciting is we know that we have this increasing body of evidence. I use the example of heat. So let's take heat and say in the Southeast United States are poor, a record of poor perinatal outcomes, maternal mortality, preterm birth, infant mortality, and how heat exacerbates those and how there is existing inequity there that's linked to um, a history of racially discriminatory policies. There are ways that I think part of what we can do for those of us who teach is teach about this legacy, both of structural discrimination, so we can help empower our trainees to address it and to dismantle it, to think bigger, like Ari said, about prevention, not just what we do right there when the patient is right in front of us in the hospital, but how we can empower our families for the rest of life that they don't spend in the exam room, which is more than 99.9% .9 of their life, hopefully, right? So instead of practicing medicine right there um, at the illness point, think about what we can do towards health prevention. And there's some really, um, we're kind of waiting for some, some additional evidence there that we can help contribute to for how do we take what we know about heat risk to pregnancy, say, and start to empower our patients right in front of us with what that means for them while we're working for a bigger picture policy change. I think that's important. And so what we can do is, as general pediatricians, we have a long history of advocacy. Advocacy is not new for us. But getting back to those who are comfortable right in the exam room, there's so much we can do in the course of a regular well visit. We talk about nutrition, we talk about exercise, we can think about more active forms of transportation that improve individual health and the community air quality when it's safe to do so. Another way that really comes up a lot is for sports physicals. Most kids who participate in sports come to their pediatrician for their annual sports physical. That is a great opportunity to help protect that child from heat exposure, talk to their parents about what it means, ways that they can protect themselves and being familiar with what the local or the, the state legal framework is for when it's this hot, what that means for maybe not having practice in full uh, equipment and things like that. These are things that we can do right there in the course of our practice. I think there's a lot of attention too now to screening for environmental determinants, um, like we have gotten uh, more adept at screening for social determinants and realizing that it's as we ask about food insecurity, we can ask about energy insecurity. We can be familiar with those resources in our community and refer, refer folks. This is an area I could go on and on and on and on. And Ari and Lisa and Rebecca, you probably heard me go on and on and on and on. So to, to spare everyone, I'll stop there and we can we can move on. No, I think that um, one of the things you said really stuck with me is teaching that history of how racism is baked into a lot of our policies, practices, and systems. Uh, I think that is really important for healthcare providers. Then you start to understand why some people might have distrust of the healthcare system, why there isn't health promoting infrastructure everywhere. So not everybody has access to that health promoting infrastructure um, in, in their neighborhoods that's conveniently accessible. And I remember when I was in graduate school teaching a unit on environmental justice to uh, the senior seminar you know, environmental ethics, uh, when it was a bunch of uh, folks who wanted to go into, uh, you know, the environmental sciences, and I was teaching a unit on environmental justice, and I was sort of talking about community informed research and community based participatory research, community owned and managed research. Um, and folks, in the context of that, I asked about the Tuskegee syphilis study, and nobody in the entire classroom had ever heard of it, or knew what it was. Um, you know, so I think that's a uh, we, need, we need to think about how we're teaching the history of systemic racism so that uh, the systems that we're all working in and a part of can, we can start to dismantle uh, the, the, that, the pieces that are currently baked in. Um, and because, you know, that's, and part of that is teaching the history um, and understanding our, our role in dismantling that, uh, those, those systems. So I really appreciate that 
Um, and the other thing you said that struck, that struck me is sports physicals. First of all, I definitely remember, I remember going star swimmer and badminton player here. Um, Baltimore City bad, badminton champ, 2005, little in fact. Um, but I remember, but, 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 but why isn't the NFL talking more about climate change? Why isn't, you know, these, these influential sports institutions um, talking more about climate? Because it's affecting their schedules. It's affecting their players. It's affecting where they can play games. You know, there are entire stadiums that are underwater at times now. Um, and why I would like the NFL, dear NFL, uh, you've heard it here, here, please start talking about climate change more. Um, I, I hear pediatricians talking about this when it comes to, to, to youth sports, but I'd like to see it. I'd like to see professional sports leagues uh, talking about climate change. So that, then we can, you know, break through to more folks who aren't talking about it as much maybe as, as we are. Um, but I want to uh, take another audience question from Jocelyn who asks, uh, we just talked a lot about treatment and, and what you do at the point of care, but she's sort of flipping that and asking about uh, flipping the framework from treatment to prevention. So how do we prevent common childhood diseases brought about by climate change? Um, so switching to prevention, what can we do? Lisa, why don't you go first? I think particularly for me as a hospital is the thing that's always top of mind when I think about um, pediatric disease and things that are preventable, asthma is largely preventable. Um, and we know that the burning of fossil fuels um, does two things, right? It causes the, the air pollution that we're constantly breathing that contributes to asthma, in addition to warming the climate um, and causing you know, more pollutants like ozone and particularly hot, hot days in particular. And so when I, I think about preventable childhood illnesses and thinking about asthma, this is another reason to transition us off fossil fuels and advocate for a transition to clean energy because it's protective um, in terms of children's health. Um, I, I think about too, in terms of preventable, um, you know, why, why for us as pediatricians, it's so important to transition us off fossil fuels and, and you know, arrest the, pro the process of global warming and thinking about what the health impacts are for a pregnant mother. Um, we know that both hot weather and we know that air pollution and extreme air pollution events like wildfire, they, these are all risk factors for premature birth, stillbirth, and low birth weight infants and premature and low birth weight have long-term consequences for a child's health. And then these things are preventable um, if we can um, transition off of fossil fuels to a clean energy economy. Okay. Ari? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I, I'm not sure I have a great answer. Um, to me, there are there, there's very few diseases that aren't already present without climate change. Climate change makes it much harder to deal with many of the problems we're already dealing with. I think one exception, there are probably others, are, are, are the appearance of new diseases. So, you know, the spread of Lyme disease in places it hasn't been, uh, the appearance of, you know, leishmaniasis potentially is growing through the heartland. There's concerns that coccidio valley fever um, is headed, you know, Lisa's way, uh, if it's not already well ensconced there. And, and you know, I think a, a certain amount of awareness to this is really critical. Um, and, and in part that's on clinicians because we shouldn't expect folks where I am to be on the lookout for Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but you know the tick is here and it may or may not show up, but it's certainly in the mix. Um, so I think there's a certain amount of, of, as we like to call it, index of suspicion for these diseases that, that can move around. You know, I, I, I think in a broader sense when someone, ask a question about climate diseases, um, I, I really try and focus on the, the and I may sound like a, I'm beating a, a horse here, but um, you know, there's so much we can do uh, when it comes to climate action that prevents diseases that are already burdensome uh, and that frankly, we're not very good at in clinics. And, and one of my favorite examples here is obesity. And I, I looked at this literature recently so there are lots of weight loss programs in clinics and hospitals around the country for children who are overweight and obese. And, and this, there have been many studies that have shown at least you know, half a year, year's worth of improvement with reductions in BMI in the order of 0.1 uh, through the population. I mean, you know, and, and, and if you're obese, your BMI is 30. So, so 0.1 reduction is not, not gonna get you very far, but it's better than going the other direction, that, that's for sure. Um, and then there are studies, and these are out of European countries, where they look at uh, BMI as a function of commuting. And the studies show that you know, if you substitute you know, one car trip with a you know, 
public transit trip, you can have an effect on BMI of like a point, like 1.0. And, and you realize very quickly, and you know the studies aren't perfect, and obviously on the other end is people who are doing active transit have huge, much larger effects. Um, but you realize very quickly that we can, you know, to me, this is a prevention of obesity strategy first and foremost. It's a health equity strategy because we know very well that people often uh, who have least access to public transit are most in need of it. Um, and oh, by the way, <laughs> it's really important for climate because a third of the emissions in the United States are, are from transportation. So to me, climate prevention is really about the way in which climate actions prevent the diseases in children. And, and so too with mental health, as Lisa was making so clearly, so too with asthma. Uh, and you know, you talk about if we got our hands around obesity, asthma, and mental health, uh, and, and you know, I'm sure any provider on this call who's dealing with adolescents knows what our state of affairs with, with adolescent mental health uh, is right now. Uh, these are enormous wins for our children's welfare. And again, the best way to decarbonize healthcare is to keep our children healthy. I love those answers. And I think what Ari was saying draws attention to that these are complex problems. So taking a complex systems-based approach is gonna be really important in addressing them. Collaboration across disciplines. And as Renee said multiple times today, which I love because I say this all the time too, is this moment calls for unprecedented collaboration and we need that. I think the um, Lancet launch today and beyond and what Lisa and Ari have said as well is true is we need to mitigate emissions to protect child health and prevent illness. And some of that includes including health and the social cost of carbon. So advocate, advocate, advocate for reduced emissions and including health um, and the social cost of carbon. That is something that we can do to prevent child illness and protect child health in a changing climate. And then as, as in our day-to-day -day as clinical providers, right, we are we know that we are stuck with some degree of change from climate change already. So we still need to adapt our practices. And um, another concrete way for, for what that may mean is thinking about the particular risk of the patient in front of us. For example, if we have a um, child with complex uh, health care needs, we may need to make sure that they, that child particularly has a disaster preparedness plan in place. If anyone has is whose life is dependent on a daily dose of medicine or who's dependent on some technology that it is critical for that child to have a disaster preparedness plan. It's already critical for them to have one. It will become even more critical in our changing climate. And so I think advocate and preparedness are the, the two things I would kind of recommend there that in, in all of what Ari and, and Lisa have said to you. You guys left me little little to add on there. Um. First, I would like to issue a correction to something I said earlier. This is why I love our audience. Um, uh, Real-time correction is that I referred to a study earlier that I really should have framed as the U.S. Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee. Um, so just want to make sure I'm um, labeling that correctly so we know who was running the study uh, and sort of who's the, the culprit in that case. So I just, I appreciate, I appreciate the active audience today. Um, and I... Um, Thank you. I think that's an important correction. So, um, and I also, I, Becca, thank you so much for emphasizing advocacy. Uh, you know, health professionals are some of the most trusted voices for climate and I, um, you know, for climate action, for information on climate and, and not only to your patients, but to elected officials. And I have been a part of hearings, you know, on, on active legislation and it makes a huge difference when practicing clinicians take a day to go and testify, take time to go and weigh in on regulation because your job is saving lives. And so when you're there advocating for legislation, it means that legislation is going to save lives. And so having your, you know, being active, you know, for those of you who are listening and are, are in the healthcare, in the public health, in the environmental health, sort of in the health world, if you're if your job is health, your elected officials need to hear from you, uh, and because your because your voice is so important and effective. Um, so, just wanted to to agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, and so, a, a quick question from the audience is about resources or courses 
um, sort of classes, courses people can take um, to learn more about climate impacts to children's health? Um, uh, are, there, are there classes to help you know, family members um, to understand the effects of climate change that it has on children's health? So anybody have any quick recommendations for classes, resources, et cetera, on uh, climate change in children's health? And I know welcome the audience to type into the chat too if you have other suggestions. Sorry, Lisa, go ahead. On the clinician side, I know Cecilia Sorensen um, from the Global Society Consortium on Climate and Health is working on a course that I think they're launching in January um, for medical providers anyway, to get kind of a survey level um, understanding of climate and health. I don't know on the, on the family side um, if, if folks have suggestions. And Lisa Patel also did a fabulous MOC part two with Karina uh, recently on for pediatricians to help us. Uh, it's a maintenance of certification activity to educate our workforce on the health effects of climate change because there's a whole cohort, all of us never heard anything about this in our medical training. So we really need to bolster our workforce capacity too. So there's some good resources coming out there for the healthcare workforce. I think Ari, you were about to say something around the educating families, perhaps? Yeah, I think it's um, it, the educating channel. I think there's probably more resources to professionals than there are, are to families. Um, uh, we created a course that that is, I think, relatively accessible, and, and it got put in the chat, um, which is free and you know uh, relatively accessible that way if you have the URL. Um, but I think it is it is an area of need, and and I, I think critically to that point, um, folks who spent their lives working on climate or come to climate from a point of interest, as in it's intrinsically motivated. I think the educational content needs to be much different to families because they often come at a disconnect. So the climate conversation starts with here are greenhouse gases, the planet's warming, and you get eventually down to something that, uh, you know, a person living their lives as they usually would, 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 would appreciate. And for a, a family member, I think it needs to start the other way around. It needs to start at, okay, are you, in, what, what, what interests you in health? Are you interested in mental health? Are you interested in nutrition? Are you interested in, you know, asthma? Are you, and, and, and for better or worse, climate change connects to every part of our bodies. And so, I, I, you know, if I had an ideal resource, it would be one that really started with, with the issues that are already uh, the kitchen table issues for, for that person, your family. The, the same, by the way, applies to uh, family discord on climate change itself. The starting account, you know, there's some really fascinating research about discordance between children and parents on climate change and how that dynamic plays out. And one strain that's clear, and there's all kinds of strains in this work that I find fascinating, is that starting from a point of existing concern rather than starting from the point of here's climate change, why don't you get it, <laughs> is, 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 is really, um, I think, more effective at trying to gain common understanding. And, and so I, I, would, I would encourage everyone to think in any space where there's either discord and understanding or just, you know, there's no inherent opposition, but it's not a common consideration. And, and I think, you know, Catherine Aho, I've heard talk many times recently about how few conversations there are in the United States on climate change. I, I you know, it, it's, 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 you know, for those of us who are spending our um, days looking at it, 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 it's somewhat surprising to realize and, and shows us how far I have to go that really very few people talk about climate change uh, with ever. So really starting with the point of contact that is familiar is, is critical. Yeah, and, and are you, yeah. oops. Go uh, ahead, Becca. You, you brought to mind um, one more thing when talking about linking it back to a specific health problem already. So not so much a course, but resources. And, and Lisa actually mentioned this earlier, our PACES, our Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Units, problem-based fact sheets like wildfire exposure. Um, the New York-based uh, PACES has some great prescriptions for prevention related to climate and health. Those are some really great places uh, to look as well. The American Academy of Pediatrics uh, website in general also has some some good resources and um, 
each of each state chapter of the AAP also has uh, climate champions in that that state chapter. So if you want more local information as well, um, I'll also say one of the ways we're trying to change the fact that not enough people talk about climate change is our Climate for Health Ambassadors training program, and um, which we've done with the American Academy of Pediatrics, and we've done in partnership with uh, Harvard Sea Change, uh, and to you know so so hopefully there's there's uh, it's a way to get folks engaged on climate. So teaching people about how climate change impacts your health, uh, you know, the solutions available, communications and advocacy skills, and then our ambassadors are going out and talking to others. And that's really exciting to see. Um, and we will be launching a, a learning management system so everybody can take that course online uh, this fall if you want um, some more information on that soon. Um, and we also, you know, it's Children's Health Month. Check out the Children's Environmental Health Network. Uh, they had CEH Day last week. It was really fun to be a part of. Um, and we are we have a Children's Health Month blog series at climateforhealth.org that you can check out. Um, so there are there are resources. APHA's Eco Bookworm, Bookworm uh, Club has great recommendations on reading um, environmental and climate change themed books with your kids. Um, Mothers and Others for Clean Air. So there are folks, there are resources. Get engaged, find find the one that, that, you know, you have fun with, um, cause there, there's, there is information, uh, out there and I encourage everybody to, to get involved in the conversation. So we're getting, we're approaching our time. So I want to, uh, we're going to have to do a little bit of lightning answers at this point, but I want to, um, Dominique asked about the process, the advocacy process for each of you. So have you, can you, can you tell a quick story? Have you weighed in on legislation? Have you been part of the, uh, sort of policy process? And how, is, how have you found it? Quickly. I can go quickly. Um, I'll, I'll give one example. Um, there, there, there was a move, there's been a movement in California, um, state, uh, city by city to pass ordinances for new buildings to be um, uh, electrified basically. So no natural gas within those buildings. And so that coalition actually reached out to us as health professionals to lend our voice um, to really talk about this as a health issue. Um, talk about how, you know, the using gas powered stoves and furnaces contributes to indoor air pollution that's terrible for children's health. And so we sort of lent our health voice to, to the campaign and we've had a lot of successes uh, locally in terms of passing some of these ordinances on electrification. That's just one example. Uh, I'll say two things. One is the first time I worked on a piece of legislation and was talking to a congressional staff, I was told that I couldn't possibly be there to talk about anything besides how much I was getting paid which tells you something about when doctors tend to show up in, in representatives' offices. Um, I'm hopeful that that is changing. I know that recently in Massachusetts, we just passed a, a carbon bill that is arguably on par with California's, which is a very robust uh, bill. And, and there are many of us who were very engaged in both doing research and, and also um, speaking directly to elected officials about the health dimensions of that work, and, and particularly the equity in Massachusetts uh, effects of uh, our transportation fleet. And um, to avoid going into a, a long personal story, I think I'll echo what these guys said is partner with people who are already in the advocacy space. So Georgia has a really robust environmental advocacy network, but that network needs the health voice and needs that health voice advocating for climate um, and children's health, centering children's health and health equity in that, those discussions. So. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics now has advocates in all 50 states, and we've been able to share what's working. So that may be getting climate on the legislative blueprint for our state's AAP. It may be creating a, a child and health policy statement for our state AAP. So even for those meetings where we're not able to be there, people can say this is what the pediatricians are in our state are saying about climate health harms. And then another uh, resource for those who are starting out in advocacy is the Med Society Consortium on Climate and Health. Um, and there's great uh, community there to elevate our voices together in advocacy. And if I may, just one final point to you, I think we also need to not forget that we need to advocate to our colleagues and at our places of practice, looking at healthcare's own carbon footprint. Yeah, I do want to just add on to the Becca's last point. This is this is an important form of advocacy, which is talk about climate change. When I talk about wildfires, I always talk about climate change. When people are complaining about how hot it is outside, I'm like, that's because of climate change. <laughs> so use those opportunities to build climate change into the dialogue. Yeah, and I um, uh, have previously been a lobbyist where I was 
paid not that much to get, you know, to, 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 <laughs> cause I was an environmental health. I was one of the good guys, right? Uh, I bring studies, not bourbon, as I would say, to to get my bills passed. Um, but I, uh, uh, so I was I was a lobbyist. I was paid to do this work, um, which is why I know firsthand wh- how important it was to have health professionals in. Um, you know, I've seen it make a difference. But I also had the experience of lobbying on uh, on legislation on climate uh, issues with Moms Clean Air Force. And when I was walking around the halls with kids, I was talking to way more people than would talk to me on other days. Uh, so just, you know, just saying uh, kids on the Hill can, you know, state, state capitals, uh, city halls, uh, and, and DC can be, can be very effective and good conversation starters. Um, when I asked my younger sister whether she wanted to come with me, she had no interest. So kind of a bummer, but, uh, <laughs> but kids can be very effective um, uh, conversation starters. So anyway, uh, so we're getting, again, penultimate question now. Uh, and I feel like we're just getting started. We're getting some great questions coming in, in the chat. So I just appreciate all of you tuning in. And if you're listening on YouTube later, um, check out our blog. That's where we post all of the links that will be that are in the chat right now. Um, we posted on the Climate for Health blog, so you can find all the links in one place um, for all the great resources that people are sharing. Um, but you've each talked about this a little already, but let's talk more explicitly about environmental justice, health equity, and children's health. Um, Samuel actually asked, uh, we got another audience question about environmental justice and child harm reduction. Um, So can each of you expand a little bit more on um, environmental justice and child harm reduction? So Becca, let's let's start with you. This is a hard question to save until last and an important one. And we have talked a little bit about environmental justice throughout. I think to expand on some of what I talked about previously and and part of what is my role in in this big picture is the education front and educating our current students and current residents about environmental justice issues, about inequities and exposures to environmental hazards and the um, structural discrimination that has rooted some of those inequities. Um, For, as an example of what that looks like in practice, if if that's helpful, um, one thing that we do now in our curriculum for first and second years is instead of just teaching about pulmonary function tests, these are those tests that measure lung volume in children, we talk about disproportionate burden of air pollution exposure, how that affects child lung capacity and child lung function growth over time, and the roots of that disproportionate exposure to air pollution in policies that have been structurally discriminatory. And um, I think that kind of education is critical for a workforce that's meant to attend to the health of our children, because how can we address these inequities if we are not addressing them if we're not taught about them, if we're not looking to dismantle them. So I know that's kind of building on some of what we've talked about before, but maybe touching on that education component is is a a new way to think about it as well. Lisa? Um, Becca said a few things that um, that I've tried to adopt in my, my practice as well in terms of teaching, teaching history and teaching place. And so I work with residents teaching them about um, advocacy and community pediatrics, and I focus on West Oakland as my example, because I think we can talk about this in generalities, but I really want the residents who work here to understand history and and draw really concrete lessons from it. West Oakland used to be a thriving um, Black community, um, culturally and economically, and then a freeway now encircles it. Um, That basically resulted in divestment and rates of asthma that are several fold times higher in the children that live within that circle compared to white children that live in the Oakland Hills just a couple of miles away. So I used examples like that to really teach about um, things like redlining and what that means for children's health. And then we try to, I work with our medical students and undergraduates on much like um, making sure that the work we do is youth led, making sure that the work we do is also EJ led. So the community organizations that our medical students work with, the EJ organization sets the agenda and we tell them we are your tools. (laughs) You tell us where you need us, how we can help you. And often they need us with for help with things like data interpretation. So that's what we do for them. Or we show up for them in meetings if they want us there. And we try to make it that we are there for their use and to help them forward their agenda. Ari? Right. Yeah, I, uh, I think we've all, the three, the, three, the three panelists have appreciated just um, how unfortunate it is to go last in the sense of not having much to offer after the first two are 
are, are uh, out there. And I, I, would, I would subscribe to that notion in my response here. Um, I, I, I would add the one small thing I would add is that um, I think among the many painful lessons of the past 18 months it, is that inequality is bad for a lot of reasons. Um, and that's certainly true of health disparities. Uh, and one of the things that's caught me by surprise is that while in, as the Lancet countdown report makes so clear, to those who look at climate uh, effects and also to the effects of air pollution, fossil fuels in general, health disparities is just part and parcel of that. There's, there's no way in which you look at the climate issue as anything other than a primary health equity issue. And yet, when you enter into conversations within the community of scholars on health equity, climate is not a part of that conversation. It actually isn't being discussed. And, and so I think it's an, another area that those of us who are engaged on climate in terms of partnership and outreach, we need to make very clear that we will never get health equity without climate action. Uh, and, and critically, for some of the health equity problems we see today, and, and, and Becca and Lisa have alluded to them, whether it's outcomes in pregnancies, uh, whether it's asthma outcomes, um, we can only get so far with more access to obstetric care and inhalers. Um, the actions that are really gonna make a difference actually are one of the, in many cases, the same as climate actions. And, and so that conversation is one I'm very eager to have um, I think it's critical because it is an important part of attaining health equity. And again, the, the fissures in society that inequities represent uh, are the very fissures that get torn open by shocks, whether they're climate shocks or pandemic shocks. And to leave them exposed makes our challenges with climate all the harder. So to me, it is absolutely critical that in all of the good work to promote health equity, we need to remember that we have a, a chunk of work to do on, on making sure that equity is seen as a, a, a climate is seen as a, as a foundation of health equity uh, in this country and, and around the world. So climate change, so climate action as you know, foundation for health equity, I think is a, a note that that is um, that we should leave it on and encourage everybody to stay engaged um, and use the resources and the conversations that we had today um, to bring to bring this movement forward um, and to support youth in their leadership on, on this movement. So uh, thank you so much, Lisa, Becca, and Ari for joining us as our guests. You know, we talked about community earlier as sort of our motivation and being in community with you today in this conversation. Um, you know, it, it has, uh, it's been a real joy and I appreciate all of you and the work that you're doing um, what you've shared here and, and your ongoing work to act on climate for kids health now and the generations to come. So we're at the end of our time. It flew by, um, but I know you've inspired our listeners to be bold and prioritize climate solutions to improve our health and our family's health. For all of our listeners, please click on the link to the survey when this webcast ends to provide your feedback. If you're watching this on YouTube, check out the description below to let us know what you think. Engage with us online with the hashtag Let's Talk Climate and be sure to subscribe and follow us for the latest thought leadership, resources, and episodes on climate action and advocacy. Check out the Eco America YouTube channel on October 28th when the next episode of Let's Talk Climate from our Path to Positive Communities program will be live. And on November 4th at 2 p.m. Eastern, please join us for the launch of our 2021 report, Mental Health and Our Changing Climate, with the American Psychological Association. So I know we talked a lot about mental health today, so I hope to see a lot of you there uh, and sign up for the Climate for Health newsletter so you don't miss a beat. From all of us at Eco America and Climate for Health, thank you. Please join me in caring for our climate in order to care for our health. Stay well, stay safe, get active, and see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye.